You know, the history of the working man has been lost. Uh, see, in the 30s, you had something different. A working class that came from Europe he understood life from a class position, a working people's position. And they looked at things that were very critical, and all that they understood. When I exhibited in 1940-42, everybody knew about my paintings. Now, only the elite guys understand about my painting, the implications of them. They're very socially, politically minded. The working class love my paintings because I paint their emotions. They don't understand. I do a big church, a nice church. They don't understand the bigness and how there's oppressed or the big Yankee Stadium and next door is all full of slums, right? Or the big building. Look at how you paint the big building. They don't see that. They're that small in the building, 90 stories. They don't get the social implication. They're not made to develop and think things out. You know, I'm doing a painting in the studio, but I'm also, from a painting's position, I'm trying to resolve space where I'm going to be an intellectual man. I'm trying to re resolve space problems. In your mind, it, it would be an inch. Now, if you get the rule and you make an inch, it's wrong. The inch has to be in your mind, not with the rule. So the face has to be spelt, felt. Now I go to Nathan's in Yonkers on, on Central Avenue, and I draw from 11 to 2 every day. So I spent three, four hours drawing, drawing, drawing. I've been at Nathan's five years, and I, I tell you, the painting, they just sing with people, very human, warm, and it just begins to flow. No! I need a little energy and a little time, a little loving in between. It'll make the painting go. If you know love, you can't paint, by the way. Let me tell you about painting and love. Painting in a, in a very, you know, strange thing, it seems. You have to be in a loving mood. It's like having an orgasm painting. It's loving, it's living. It's like, or anybody. I'm not, yeah, I use the word, or I don't mean in that sense. The person's alive. It was mine and his emotion working together, which is really loving things, you know. That's what love's all about, I think, and life is all about. I listen to a lot of classical, but I find classical is too intellectual. Has no, look, look at that soul, look at that, look at that. Look, look at that. You know, really. It's love making. Most, I think, black music, jazz music is love making. Look at so poetic, it's poetry, you know. It's like loving the child, loving the breast, loving the woman, loving the beautiful form. And I think that's what really is out of jazz, the softness, you know, the shape of something. I think that's what they like, the mouth, the lips. I think what good jazz is. And, and you know, it's interesting when you meet a lot of these black guys, very bright, sensitive fellas. Yes, Because once you have a little knowledge, you're painting it because the working class sense that you know something, which makes it rough. I go in a bar room over here for three years, I can't talk to anybody. I say, this is fucking rough, we know something. They want to talk about cause of nothingness. And they're afraid that I will raise a question that has meaning. And I don't raise them, I just talk common sense. All of y'all. All of y'all. When you don't have a formal education, and then you see, I was raised in a neighborhood, if you use four letters, so I never got a large vocabulary. So it made it difficult for me to speak with the wise guys. But I find out one thing with the wise guys, the guys got knowledge. You know where you get knowledge? Through books. You want to be smart? Read books. The Anglo Saxon knew the Jews do it. And uh, I said, oh, I've read a guy, I said, oh, I know where you got that book. So it's, oh, I'm going to read the same fucking book. So I'm finding out that you want to be smart in this, in this society. It had nothing to do with brains. You go to the library, you get all the facts. And one of the things that I find about the working class, and I'm mainly particular about the and the Italians and the Irish and the longshoremen and the guys at work, is that, by God, they don't have a worldview. They know about the crap game, they know about the horses, they know about the who is the prince, the politician, but they never read a book. No oh, man, you gotta read a book. You gotta read a book. You gotta have a worldview. You gotta know what goes on in the outside world. Who's Michelangelo? Who's Karl Marx? Who's Engels? Who's Einstein? What this world's all about? 
Ralph Fasanella is one of the most important American painters of the 20th century. Fasanella's art captures and critiques much of the American experience from post-World War II through the 1990s. Ralph Fasanella was born on Labor Day, 1914, into an Italian immigrant family in the Bronx, New York. Ralph's father, Giuseppe, or Joseph, was an ice man, and his mother, Ginerva, or Jean, was a garment worker. Fasanella grew up in a tough neighborhood, and he started working at a very young age. He left school in the eighth grade and had no formal training in art. At age 30, while working as a union organizer, Fasanella spontaneously began to draw and paint. Through the influence of his mother, he became interested in organized labor and anti-fascism at an early age. In the 1930s, he became very active in union and anti-fascism causes. He was a member of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade and went to Spain in the late 1930s to fight against Francisco Franco and his fascist army. Coming back to the U.S., he became a union organizer for the United Electrical Workers and achieved major successes in the 1940s before he began to paint. I was organizing for the CIO, the Electrical Worker Union, and uh, we organized some big companies. I was involved in the Disbury organization. We organized for 18,000 workers. I was involved in the uh, American Safety Razor put out, I think, Gem Blade. I did a little um, in the sing and sew machine. I was involved in that county, Worcester County, and we were winning wage increases and fighting the AFL, the AFL then, you know. I was in, on a vacation. I met this uh, young lady, and uh, she had some material and gave it to me and said, try to sketch. I think I made a drawing of a shack I had there, a little cabin on the water. It's up in the Keene, New Hampshire. When I did the outside, the inside, this young woman said, gee, that's not a bad thing. It's very nice. First thing I knew, I went back to work on, on a UE staff, and, uh, geez, I was drawing. Gee, what are you doing? I said, I'm drawing. What are you doing? I don't know. I'm just drawing. Right from the start, he saw his paintings as an extension of his labor activism. As a union organizer, his goal was to teach workers about their conditions and their history to give them a sense of who they were so they could be more unified in their struggle for better working conditions. Paul D'Ambrosio, an art historian, began to study Fasanella's art and mount exhibitions of his work in the early 1980s. Thank you very much, Jim, and thank you for inviting me here to Lawrence. It's kind of a nostalgic. I always start this lecture with a slide of this painting. It's called May Day, and it was done in 1948. And it depicts a May Day parade of the type that occurred regularly, annually, of course, during the 1930s, when thousands and thousands of marchers would converge on Union Square, which is depicted on the left side of the canvas, and march uh, for uh, jobs, security, democracy. And uh, here, Fasanella has depicted them marching. Uh, of course, he's painting in 1948, so this is the past. And they're marching toward the future. This almost uh, nebulous, <laughs> vision of a utopian society where workers have the time, the leisure, the opportunity to improve themselves, improve their minds, enjoy life, etc. It's important to remember that the May Day movement was all about the eight-hour workday. This one is called Pie in the Sky. It's also from 1947. You see the street. You can see inside the various uh, tenement apartments. Uh, and it, what you see as you go down the street, past the stickball game, past the old Italian women sitting out in the street, you see this tall church spire leading you upward to this otherworldly vision of heaven. And the painting is called Pie in the Sky. And that is um, derived from an old IWW song. Uh, the notion of a better life in heaven is, is, uh, is a myth, and a dangerous myth, because it keeps people from trying to create a better life on Earth. And on a tip from a friend, he went to Lawrence, Massachusetts, and spent two years in Lawrence researching the 1912 Bread and Roses strike. 
and came up with a series of 14 paintings that showed uh, the life of a mill town and the events of the strike. Nineteen twelve was the time of the great Lawrence textile strike. The huge mills, the huge looms have been built in Lawrence and Lowell and, and other cities all over New England. And the young women came down from the failing farms of New Hampshire and Vermont and Maine to work in those new giant mills. Or young women from the low countries uh, in Europe or from France came over as contract laborers, good enough to sweat their lives out at the looms, but not good enough to be citizens. Some of those women were dying at the average age of 26 because of the dust in the weave rooms. The average age of 26. Well, they struck. The issues were wages, hours, and conditions, of course. The strike was won. Oh, a hard, hard, bitter strike, though, all through January. There was no way to feed the kids, there was no food. So they found sympathizers all over New England, as far south as New York, and they sent the kids on the train to, to, to wait to strike out. Well, now there was a young woman carrying a picket sign during that strike, and the sign said, we want bread, yes, but roses, too. So that became known as the Bread and Roses Strike, and this is the song that came out of it. As we come marching, marching in the beauty of the day, a million darkened kitchens, a thousand mill lost gray, are brightened by the beauty a sudden sun discloses. And the people here are singing bread and roses, bread and roses. Well, that Lawrence put me on the map, but I put Lawrence on the map too. Everybody knows the Lawrence strike in 1912. This one is called Red Sky. Fresno spent a lot of time walking and looking at mill buildings, and uh, many of his first paintings of this series done in 1976 have this sort of quiet and pensive mood. This one with the red paint, though, really symbolizes the seething anger of the workers inside. This is called Milltown Weaving Department and it has the large weaving department of this, of this mill depicted in this uh, very, very steep uh, perspective and cutaway view to the right, and a street, a working class street to the left, to show the two sides, you know, home and work of the, the workers in the mill buildings, because the mill buildings were long since vacant. And so he slowly repopulated the mill buildings before he tackled the actual strike. By the way, no alarms, I was on penance. What I mean by on penance, I went there and I knew nobody and I, I lived in Hawaii. When Ralph Fasanella came to Lawrence in October of 1975, he stayed in this building, the YMCA, overlooking the Lawrence Common. And every morning and every night from his third floor window, he would look out over the Common, over Common Street, which we can see in the background. He would look at the Bay State Building on the corner, the City Hall Building with its tower in Golden Eagle, and in the far distance, the Everett Mills, the largest mill building in Lawrence. This one is called Meeting at the Common, and it's a huge work. It's over at 1199, and you can see it. It's about 110 inches wide, and it shows the, uh, the gathering of workers on the Lawrence Common, as they did nearly every day to hear the strike leaders that included Elizabeth Gurley Flynn and Big Bill Hayward. The next painting that he did in 1977 it's called Lawrence 1912, the Bread and Roses Strike. And here the workers are in, in uh, uh, full assembly. The National Guard has uh, marched fully into the city. They're trampling here a child. Uh, workers are disrupting the, the mills, destroying equipment, tipping over buses. This is really a, a full force uh, uh, clash between the, the guardsmen and the workers. And he picks up again on the image of the crucifixion that he used in his father's portraits to show, he, in this case, a textile worker uh, crucified. Museum in North Andover, the textile museum, and the library in Lawrence gave me all the information, so I, I absorbed it physically, emotionally. Then I went into to Lowell, and I, I did the drawings and the paintings of how the mills work. In 1978, he was given a one-man show at the Lawrence Public Library, 
And just a couple of months prior to that show, he felt that he had one more painting in him. And uh, he completed it just before the beginning of the show. And it's the largest work of the series. And it's the only one that really incorporates the whole strike and the whole experience that he had thought about from the beginning. It's the monumental painting that shows everything from the, the immigrants coming from Italy, uh, the IWW coming from the West. And it was really the convergence of these these immigrants and from Europe and these socialists from the West that create this explosive environment in, uh, in Lawrence. And you've got all the now familiar uh, activities, the assembly, the National Guard, uh, the disruptions of the, of the uh, mill operations, the uh, trial of Edder and Giovanniti. And here he's got the Lawrence Public Library uh, uh, in the, on the corner here. It really was not there, but the library was his link to the past and to the, uh, to the strike. His research was greatly facilitated by the librarians. I made a name in Lawrence with the, with the 1912 painting. You know, I did 18 paintings on Lawrence. And uh, they're kind of all over the country. And I think one's going to the Capitol. We're just waiting for some Italians to give me some money. And they don't. They give it to the horses and Cadillacs. <laughs> Not libraries, but swimming pools and stacks in front of the houses, but the living culture, not nada. If you're a neurotic and you want to kill, you want to rape, you want to do this, spot, get on TV. Try to, try to tell a labor story. You know, try, I, I sent the whole press out. No, nobody showed up. Anyway, we're, try, we, we're very close. We have the commitment of all the politicians. They're willing to hang the great strike in the capital. Well, that's quite an achievement, you know. I've done a lot of baseball. I can make a lot of money fighting baseball. That's not my thing. But if I can get these things, then I think I made my contribution. Ralph's painting, The Great Strike, was hung in the hearing room of the House Subcommittee on Education and Labor at the United States Capitol in May 1993. Following the 1994 elections, the Republican majority had the painting removed in the spring of 1995. The painting, Lawrence 1912, The Great Strike, now proudly hangs at the Lawrence History Center, Lawrence, Massachusetts. I live in the village on Sullivan Street between uh, Bleecker and Houston, and I went to St. Anthony's School and that was my roots, and that's been my roots since then, even though I've been away from there for 60 years or so. I think it was that time from about 4 to 7, 4 to 8, I was able to sense the world was all about. My father was an Irishman. I would go out to Borough Park after the second time and say, you, you take the train by yourself. I was 7, 8 years old. I would take the BMT train at Prince Street. But in, in, in going to Brooklyn every day, I would ride the trains. And that's where I got my overlooking view from an airplane. You ride the train, I was looking at the city all the time, so that I never forgot it. I, I caught it there. Also, going to train here, the Daily News, the Daily Mirror just came out. It was Daily News, and they had pictures of scenes going on in the city, you know, the usual story rape fire truck. But out of there, I think I started to learn how to read. I never learned in school anything. I didn't learn a thing in school, but through the newspapers. I began to learn how to read, look at baseball. I became a baseball bug, which I never forgot. Baseball and religion, the same thing. Get a young age, you never get out of it. I think that's why most kids stay with baseball or stay with religion. 1927, 28, then I went to the Bronx and my father had a nice route there. I think another reason that I'm able to see buildings and individual people I work the Nash route, and I would go into people's homes. And that's how I'm able to know the interiors of different houses, different, different people, you know, and I've always got in, into houses. I also believe I learned how to balance. I learned the story of physics, which I didn't understand. There I think I learned about balance and weight. I'm trying to tell you that nothing comes unconsciously. You learn it from direct experience. Fasanella's family played a very important part in his art. The series of paintings called Iceman Crucified features Ralph's father, Joe, who delivered ice for a living. 
I like my father in a way. You know, he's a like a long charm. He worked hard. He was a compassionate guy, very compassionate. I think like a lot of working men, uh, my mother was a much more advanced woman than him. And I, I don't know, I, did, I was too young to understand. But the frustration of working men is a rough one, you know. He read a very important uh, novel by Pietro Di Donato called Christ in Concrete. And it inspired him to see his father as Christ. And so he uh, began with this early painting in 1950 to show his father, the Iceman, crucified with the ice tongs around his head and set in a niche that's actually a tenement foyer. Uh, and you can see the tenement windows above. And uh, he, the idea for the ice tongs comes from his mother. He would say, I'm going to take those ice tongs and I'm going to shove them in your ears. And so this is how he got this image. But it also it becomes a very powerful visual image of uh, a working man and uh, a message about sacrifice. As he uh, moved into the 1950s, his father uh, had left the family and actually went back to Italy in 1954. He's being uh, lowered with pulleys from this apartment, this old ice box with the ice man crucified in it, being lowered to the street while the new refrigerator is being hoisted up. So this is really a, a painting about transition, about change, and, and about loss. His greatest ice man crucified was painted a couple of years later. In this one, in this one, he really has a naturalistic repose that really, I think, is more uh, reminiscent of a of a Renaissance descent from the cross than a than a crucifixion. Here, Joe, the ice man is is larger than life. He's set up in the middle of a street as if he were this great monument that you couldn't drive around without uh, without seeing. And always includes uh, little uh, admonitions, lest we forget. Uh, which uh, really comes from um, early 20th century war memorials, and this is a, a sort of a fallen victim in a sense. Family Supper is Ralph's loving and moving tribute to his mother, Geneva, and all strong immigrant women who held their families together. My mother was a type of woman, she had sex kids, she'd make you talk. She would look with bright people, people had ideas, you know. Oh, he's nice, you could bring him in, he's got some ideas. And uh, of course, I found her later on, she was uh, an activist in the union, she was chairwoman in 1923, that's a long time ago. And she was an anti-fascist way back before the people knew what fascism about. This painting is at Ellis Island, and it's another fantastic commemorative work. <coughs> it's called Family Supper, and it depicts a cutaway view of his family's tenement uh, apartment on Sullivan Street and uh, the family sitting around really at, at dessert. They've got espresso and cannoli and various pastries on the table. But his mother is the one at the head of the table. And I think his mother's influence on him uh, caused him to see her that way and remember her that way. His father is off to the side. But for anyone with uh, any knowledge of tenement life or working class roots, it really is an encyclopedia of the familiar in terms of material culture. And I think he is very adept at showing the various aspects of, of tenement life. Uh, the flour sack used as a hand towel, for example, the old ice box, the sewing machine, the trunk from Italy. It's his mother that's front and center, and his mother's crucifixion is above the bureau on the back wall of the tenement. And interestingly, when Joe is crucified, he's thoroughly crucified and he's done. His mother, however, doesn't have time to be crucified. She's got the kids hugging her, she's got the laundry, she's got trying to hold the family together in hard times. And so this is really a, a, a tribute to the, the sacrifice of his, of his mother. He does include a, a, a detail of an ice bucket down here that reads, in memory of my, father's, my father Joe, the poor de bastard died broke, and to all Joes who died the same. And here I would hear about the socialist movement. We used to celebrate May. They had no idea what it was. We were, uh, my mother would talk about Sacco and Manzette. I still don't know what it was. She would talk about the Lawrence thing. I still don't know what it was. But later on, these notes come to you. Now, I heard some guys talk about eight hours a day, five days a week. A worker man has a right. And the, the problem of the world is economics, not religion, not, not people, not minorities. The big guys run the world, and we're, we're the mopies at the bottom. 
<laughs> so that made me labor conscious. I became very labor conscious. This one is called Build Your Union, and it, um, it really crystallizes his thoughts on the labor movement and on uh, how labor unions, he felt, had to go beyond <coughs> simply economic issues to look at the whole lives of the workers, and so it only uh, stands to reason. This was the type of painting when Fazanella had a creative block, he couldn't think of any ideas, didn't know what to paint, he would always go back and paint a union hall to try to get going again, and this always lifted his spirits. As he continued to paint in the 1950s, he had a lot of difficulty holding a job. He was blacklisted, and so he went from a menial job, one menial job to another, until he found the uh, Maury Machine Shop in Long Island City. The advantage of Maury Machine Shop is that it had been organized by United Electrical, and he was able to get a job there and keep a job there for several years without uh, having any trouble. And so he painted in 1953 kind of a monumental tribute to a well-run union shop. And this one is called Maury Machine Shop. It's from 1953, a tribute to work and to, to work as it should be. And the guys that came out of my man in that period, I'll go and say it later, I remember Roosevelt, our General Lewis, our Harry Bridges, our Mark Antonio, and the King. These are my heroes of my lifetime. These are great men, monumental men. I think King saw the American worldview and it had a place in this world for a better world, you know? And he was one of my heroes. King is one of my heroes. And, and uh, as I said, Mark Antonio LaGuardia. But Mark was an exceptional man. Mark uh, had a feeling for people. Uh, what happened with the Italian, and he was elected many times, he was defeated because they uh, jeremined the, the neighborhood. In 1949, he ran for city councilman on the American Labor Party ticket uh, with Vito Marcantonio when Marcantonio was running for mayor. And he was uh, a great admirer of Marcantonio. Marcantonio was in many ways a political mentor to Fasanella in his mature years. Uh, but in 1954, Marcantonio died suddenly and of a heart attack. And uh, Fasanella expressed his grief uh, over uh, Mark Antonio's death uh, with this painting called Death of a Leader that shows the, uh, the, um, the thousands of people that lined up to view Mark Antonio's casket uh, after his death. Another great loss during the time uh, for Fasanella was the execution of Julie, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg in 1953. He felt strongly that they were uh, innocent. He felt strongly that they had been framed and that they were executed uh, uh, illegally and immorally. And he painted this work uh, in, uh, almost immediately after the execution to express his outrage. Uh, Capitol dome and portico symbolize uh, Amer the American government and American power. This Last Supper motif here in the building with military and business leaders toasting uh, their, the Rosenbergs are presented almost as if they were part of a ritual sacrifice. This garden party, uh, the title of the painting is Garden Party, where some uh, people are falling over drunk and you've got uh, military people, you've got the judiciary represented and various other aristocratic uh, types. Along the outside of the uh, garden party are protesters protesting the execution, being kept at bay by a high um, uh, metal fence. This type of painting is the type that Fasanella did uh, time and again in the 1950s as a protest to what was going on in the outside world, but it's important to emphasize that these were not paintings that he could show. He couldn't really uh, share these with much of an audience in his own time. He lived in a time that was hostile to his beliefs, and uh, when people came to the apartment to view his paintings or to talk to him, Paintings like this and May Day would have been put away so that they couldn't see them. It's always interesting to me that he painted for 25 years uh, with almost no recognition and uh, continue, continued working. Uh, he didn't seem to need uh, the uh, affirmation of the art establishment. He preferred to ask workers their opinions of his paintings, and he knew from their reaction that what he was doing was worthwhile. He painted some of his most celebratory scenes in the 1950s as well. This one is called Festa, and it's really a composite, thank you, a composite of the San Gennaro uh, feast as well as other Italian festivals that 
uh, Fasanella experienced in, uh, in his lifetime. He also painted in 1957 his monumental tribute to New York City. He was living on the Upper West Side at the time, and he really encompassed the entire city in this work. Uh, this two-block stretch here in the foreground was really a composite of about 40 blocks of uh, Broadway from uh, about 143rd Street down uh, that he brought together into this very lively and um, uh, detailed um, rendition. Columbus Circle, of course, the 59th Street Bridge, Triborough Bridge, and Brooklyn, Queens, and Long Island beyond. The Mad 60s exhibit was held in January 1993 at Westchester Community College in New York. Um, the 1960s was, was definitely his most prolific period. And when you look closely at the canvases and you compare them to other periods of his painting, there's a, a kind of emotion that's just poured right into the canvas that you don't see in many of his other paintings. When you look at these paintings as a whole series, you really get an idea for what the 60s was all about between the music and you know, all the things that were going on in the city. And, the, and you also get a feeling of his creativity and his depth as, as an artist. And you see his most abstract and most realistic painting techniques combined in, in the same canvases. So that's why I thought it was important to show these as a group. The, the press gave it a, a kind of a note of freedom, but I, I look at it differently. I, it was a, sure it was a mad 60, but in that madness of the destruction, you're allowed, you're allowed to swear, you're allowed to wear your hair. Anything you want to do, you did. And nothing constructive came out of the thing. You can do anything you want to do. Only when you get don't change society. Don't leave the power structure. They got up, they run the ball game. You know, when, when King tried something, organized the, the Department of Sanitation, they knock them off. When Malcolm X became political, they knocked them off. When Kennedy tried to do something, change the world, they knocked them off. As long as you do what they want them to do. In the 1960s, he was uh, inspired by uh, the political activity of the civil rights movement, uh, the anti-war movement a little bit later, to uh, go back to politics in his work and create a series of paintings that are really strong uh, protest paintings. We have the scarlet letter A from Nathaniel Hawthorne in the sense of a witch hunt. It also can be seen to stand for America or Adam, really the sinister energy behind the whole uh, Rosenberg execution. He has the Rosenberg seated on this stained glass throne, the uh, now familiar figures of uh, the military leaders and government leaders and business leaders congratulating each other for their execution. Uh, the row of prison cells here with the Rosenbergs at far right and left, separated from each other, uh, removed from their home, from their children. And it really, this painting is one that, that tries to pull all the, the heartstrings, I think, of people that felt the Rosenbergs were innocent. I, or I'm going to make a little confession. I've never said it before. You might as well, I might as well tell it now. One of the things being part of the left, you, you always felt you were on a guilt trip. That goddamn <coughs> government's always after your back. And I, to be honest with you, I was always interested in America. I wasn't interested, I wasn't interested in Russia. You know, I, I get a feeling these paintings, we're too close to them. They have a value when we're not here, maybe 100 years from now, when they want to know history, you look at paintings. <laughs> I was listening to Dizzy Gillespie then when I did this painting. I usually play a lot of jazz when I, early painting I played classical and then recently I played jazz. And I try to kind of put the history of what goes on in different periods. And this is the, you know, the period of uh, the Rosenberg were hung and then you have the jazz land and baseball and the bar rooms. Up, up in the corner, I, I didn't get it. I've been trying to do Last Supper, but I found out the capitalists is not their Last Supper. They're around for a long, long time. We thought they were going to disappear. And, you know, what the hell, I got into the movement when I was 18 years old, and I thought capitalism wouldn't be, but I find out stronger than ever. In fact, New York Times had an article the other day. It came out, I said, it cost the American government 
91 billion dollars to beat socialism, you know, it's a big price, but they beat it. I think the thing that's really missing this goddamn world of ours, we don't have religion, it's lost. But we, didn't have, we don't have any other commitment that's honest. You know, we found out that the left, right, and center sells out. So a man has, has, hasn't got a handle. Anytime the, the boys upstairs are in trouble, they find a goat and they burn them. I have to tell the other people, keep quiet. We know what's going on. Shut your mouth and go to work. We are really modern wage slaves. We got a car, we got air conditioning, but we never seem to get out of the hole. We just make enough to get back and maybe take a vacation, but we never have surplus profit. They take it all, the extra money. They run the crap game, and we're the players, and we're the suckers. And they got all the guilt. Uh, that's the name of the game. That's capitalism. It was all an accident, by the way. My fingers were frozen. I was always complaining. I was in trouble. My wife said, before we got married, I'm mostly not taking a guy I met. Always frustrated. Frustration, I wanted to say something. This painting is called McCarthy Press, and it shows the Rosenbergs, after the execution, being lowered into their graves by a large crane. And it also has a lot of newspapers that, uh, with screaming headlines about reds. Uh, this one, this painting is really about how the press manipulated public opinion. So everything is reds, 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 and everybody's, all the people are glancing at the painting, and it's this hysteria that of course, links uh, directly to the, um, the execution. This, this painting is, we call it, Adam, uh, a bomb. Uh, uh, you know, it's all the people in, inside the bomb. They're watching a ball game. They're going to the bar. Uh, they're, uh, they're going to church. They're living life as usual. In the meantime, uh, the whole world is ready to explode. Mm -hmm. It makes you think of the Twin Towers thing, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, they're bringing all the ammunition in, and nobody knows what's going on. And did, did you see they had 100 Secret Service cars down the bottom there? 100, 100. I didn't, they had a special department. You know. The place was getting ready to be blown up. And it's the same thing with people today. You know, we, we, don't, we don't know what's happening all around us. Uh, and then in the middle at the bottom, he has this, this uh, blonde floozy. Uh, sitting on top of a, of a general, hiding his eyes, and then the, the guy examining in the lower left-hand corner. Half of these paintings have never been exhibited, half of them, and all the galleries wouldn't touch them. I think the New York Times been afraid to handle me since the day I painted. They don't know what to do with Ralph. They don't know what the atom bomb. They have, they have no, you know, they just don't know what, what, what do you do with this guy? <coughs> and I can exhibit, I can be here, I can be there. We had a the show at Automation House 10 years or 20 years ago, we had over 10,000 people. You know, never reported. 10,000 people. In Lawrence, we had thousands of people in Lawrence, thousands of kids come to our shows. They never write it up. They don't know how to handle them. And this I did when a Pope came to America, when a Pope came to the Yankee Stadium, you know? And then uh, the Vietnam War, and I show you the Museum of Modern Art. On one side, I show you the real side of it, and then on the extreme right, the intellectual side. You know, this is for the, the art world, because they think I'm primitive <laughs> and kind of stupid, <laughs> and kind of stupid. I'm so now, I'm involved in Nathan's, and I begin to find out there's only one type of painting you have to make, a human paintings. All the other ones mean nothing, completely nothing. I've been five years at Nathan's, and I found out the human race is there. And by being with these people, my, my paintings have changed. It'd be more human, more human. You can make all the modern designs you want to make. You better make people because they have all the designs you want. They have all the coloring, all, you know, they're, each one is a, is a, a flower in its own. What happens to, has to be, uh, I think if you say the truthful thing, get away with it. You gotta be sub objective and very, as much as objective you are, that's as much as subjective you have to be. You see it this way and you gotta paint it that way. And that way, if it's a feeling that comes out as art. He did a large work uh, dealing with the death of John F. Kennedy. And this one is called American Tragedy. It shows the Kennedy motorcade going into this, what almost looks like this, uh, Tunnel and uh, House of Ill Repute, 
You've got uh, Oswald here with his gun drawn. You've got other allusions to the notion of a conspiracy. Uh, coming out of that same tunnel, Barry Goldwater, who was nominated just months later, and uh, this figure in the center riding on a black horse, roughshod over the grave of Kennedy, part businessman, uh, wealthy oil man, part Klansman, sort of a composite image. Symbols, uh, images from Life magazine of the uh, civil rights movement uh, here on the left, combination oil wells and missile silos on the right. It's not subtle imagery. I made five or six trips to the West Coast and, and through Texas and that area. And then, uh, as, I, as I'm painting, these things come out of me, and I, that's how I got those things from being in, in, in Texas, the oil wells. And this is a composite of Coney Island as a kid. Well, I, I took the I took the tunnel on Canal Street and put it together. Now I finally decided, 15, 20 years ago, make a painting on sex and make it beautiful. So I try to say love is a beautiful thing, and sex is beautiful. So I made this kind of a painting. Okay, this painting is called Queen City. Street and uh, same this on the left side are, are uh, the civil rights battle, right, Rob? Yeah, yeah. And I don't know how so many symbols come out, why they get a color like that. And I think this is what art is really about. You really can't say, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. It doesn't work. <laughs> it's what you have inside of you is going to come out of you. And that coming out makes it, I think, makes it good art anyway. It's my, my interpretation of it. Just in my painting, I have a painting called Pine Sky at Home. Uh, I remember when I started a painting many, many years ago, and people say, Rob, but how come, you know, your people are always alive? Well, I've, never, I've known a lot of workers the whole my lifetime. Headaches and heartaches and all this stuff. Tremendous turmoil in the house, always alive, never dead. <laughs> so I can't paint dead windows. I can't see dead homes. I can't see negative things. I was on ice route with my father. We, he had a couple of hundred customers, maybe out of two, three hundred customers, 15, 20 customers were negative. Most people clean ice boxes, clean homes, they cook, they have a family life. His order always with a spark. They, they don't run up in gin mills all day. Working people, I've always said, don't have the opportunity of being erotic. They have to shape up. The black woman I put in there, a little gas station I have. Seven kids, and they're all piano, wonderful kids. You know. It's, it's a hard life if you have a little culture in the house. Not, not too easy. I, I, I think, that, no, I, the difference, what, what, I, what I think is what happened with me, you have to be socially minded. You have to have a class consciousness. See, we talk of the rich and poor, but we never talk of classes, and there is. One of the things that curtailed his career in the 1940s, he actually had a couple of one-man shows in the 1940s, uh, was the onset of the Cold War mentality where political and social content in art was de-emphasized and things like abstract expressionism became very popular, apolitical art in a sense. And that has really worked against artists that have tried to show politics in their work ever since the 1950s, really through at least the 1970s. Fresnella had very, very uh, harsh words for abstract art. He felt that it was a cop-out, that it didn't communicate with people. But at the same time, he had a, a, a very strong sense of, uh, a, a visual sensitivity toward forms and shapes. And he had very, very mixed feelings about religion. He loved it visually. To him, it also was a, a source of oppression, I think. Uh, mainly because of the protectory experience. He was not actually raised as a strict Catholic. I spent uh, 27 months in reform school, a Catholic reform school. So that's where I got my education. And it didn't help me out. You saw what's happening to the Catholic priests today. They're all brought by charges. <laughs> Holy rollers they were. And by the way, the fundamentals are difficult. You've got to remember, most religions want to kill every other religious guy. So I don't buy that stuff either. 
You see, I think the world is made of two things. One is an objective world, and one is the way you really feel. One is how you analyze it, you see it, and one is your reaction. And what's my reaction? My reaction was the way people live, the way people are, the baseball games, the church, kids playing in the street, people working in the factories. And in the late 60s and early 70s, he moved from protest toward commemoration. And he did some of his greatest works looking back at his own past. This one is called Dress Shop. It's in our collection at Cooperstown. And it's the garment factory where his mother worked, where he would often go as a young boy. But in, as in a lot of his works, it's a composite not only of space but of time. And on the left side, he's got the uh, Sullivan Street neighborhood in the early morning hours from the 1920s when he used to get up and go on the ice route. And in the, on the left side, or on the right side, he's got the Bronx neighborhood where he and a couple of friends ran a gas station in the 1960s. A uh, gas station he had purchased to, to avoid being harassed and uh, fired for his, uh, for his background. You see, you're learning from people all the time. You're always learning. And I don't believe that, uh, because, oh, look, Ralph, look how you paint. I said, listen, I went to church for three years every morning. I had paint stained glasses. I went to ball, ball parks. I saw a ball ball game. You got hair on your head. I played ball. I was in jail. I was there. I did all these things. So I'm going through a lot of direct experiences and felt them emotionally. This is a painting uh, done in 1946, a year after he started uh, drawing. And it is of a, a church. It's actually a composite of a couple of different churches. I think the resonance of his reform school experience is expressed in the uh, resemblance of the church to a uh, sarcophagus or coffin. But it also shows some of the urban street life he would have known and experienced uh, throughout his whole life. Toward the end of uh, his career, when he got back from Lawrence, he came back to a New York that was uh, greatly changed. And um, it actually had declined in the 1970s. One of his great uh, nostalgic paintings, memory paintings, that he did upon his return was called Old Neighborhood. And it's a scene of the 215th Street in the Bronx where he grew up, a very, very uh, lively neighborhood where his father stabled his horse and where he would play stickball. Just a very, very um, sort of nostalgic and, and sentimental look at, uh, at a community. On December 10th, 1991, a postage stamp based on Fasanella's painting, The Old Neighborhood, was issued by the World Federation of United Nations Associations to commemorate International Human Rights Day. In 1972, New York Magazine featured Mr. Fascinella and his, and his remarkable works, calling him perhaps the greatest primitive painter since Grandma Moses. Maybe it's not a bad idea the United Nations to carry the ball for us and get them all together and try to resolve the problem the world we live in. It's a miserable world we live in. Now. He painted New York uh, and he painted baseball. And baseball was his great love. And in the early 80s, he developed a formula for showing baseball that was very visually dynamic. He tilted the field, the playing field, into vertical perspective while leaving the stadium and the city in, uh, in real perspective. And it really creates a dynamic image. This is Yankee Stadium. Uh, but in this painting, he's not just showing you baseball. He really is showing the change that he saw in New York, the decline of the old New York, the rise of these uh, non-human uh, uh, glass towers over the old uh, brick tenements, the wrecking ball here, uh, this jail filled with uh, black prisoners, his comment on uh, the plight of the inner cities, his old gas station now decrepit and abandoned, and everywhere uh, graffiti and, uh, and litter. Not, not the graffiti and litter is, isn't, isn't always negative. He saw that at times as a sign of a lively street and a lively community, a productive street, as he liked to call it. He uh, drove by his old gas station that he had in the 1960s and saw that it had been abandoned, but kids were using it as a playground. And he admired the creativity of the kids 
and the notion that even when it, during its operation, when he ran the gas station, it was kind of a, a hub of the community, and even in its decrepit state, it still was. I think that this is a this painting called Gas Station Playground is really a statement of, about the uh, the adaptability uh, uh, and the resilience of the working class to very adverse conditions uh, in the city. Throughout the uh, 90s, even though Fazanala was uh, aging, he lived to be 83, he continued to paint right up until his death, and he continued to have grand schemes. He really wanted to do a painting about the end of the Cold War, and I have it in a series of slides that show its development. Here he has Lenin in a sarcophagus that's also a huge Russian sports stadium, and always he includes text in his paintings as well as imagery that uh, begin to shape his message. What's happened over here under the Reagan administration, we got a, a kind of super American nationalism, which in many ways in Europe we call fascism, but here they don't need fascism. They got dope, they got pot, they got baseball, they got cars, they got things. So they don't have to quell you. They have no riots, they have no demonstrations. So they have their own type of fascism in their own way. They have no thinking people. I began working on Fasanov extensively in 1993, and so. I worked with him very closely from 93 to 97 and periodically would photograph this work as it took shape in his studio. You get a sense of how he thought and how he rethought these images and how they developed. Ralph Fasanella died in 1997 at the age of 83. Fasanella's work throughout his entire life depicted working class people who were also his intended audience. Ralph was famously quoted as saying, I didn't paint my paintings to hang in some rich guy's living room. Public domain was a really extraordinary and innovative effort to put Fasanella's work on public view. It was founded by a union organizer by the name of Ron Carver in the mid-1980s. Carver saw Fasanella's work in an exhibition and was so moved by it that he became determined to put it on view in public spaces where working people would have access to it, either in a library or a museum or a public space of some kind, even the New York City subway. Fasanella this morning is our guest <laughs> and to provide a custom-made environment for one of Ralph's great works. Art is at home in the subway. It belongs in settings like this every bit as much as in museums. Ralph, as your subway riders comes home to the environment that inspired it, we are thrilled to have it. We like thinking that from now on, the painting will be here to cheer 26,000 subway customers who pass by daily. It's quite a group of people to see it every day. On May 16, 1991, Fasanella's painting, Family Supper, was permanently installed at the Ellis Island National Immigration Museum for millions of visitors to see. Ralph Fasanella has painted the soul of our city in this painting and in others. The immigrant tenement homes the garment factories, city streets, subway cars, Coney Island, the rich, exciting tapestry that working people have created in New York City. It's almost overwhelming to think of the fact that there's going to be so many millions of people appreciating my father's work, as basically, I guess, we always have. The thing that I always believe is that my father's work is really not meant for museums. It's meant for people to people. see. It's meant uh, for public places, because in a museum, you know, it's very often get shelved and housed away. No, it's important to have paintings like this in public places. So it's a great day. <laughs> you know, my personal uh, interest is the painting that's in this exhibit called The American, American Tragedy. I think it's one of the finest paintings Ralph has ever done. And it depicted a period in American history that nobody in this country will ever be able to forget or want to forget, the assassination of President Kennedy. That's going to be my personal goal, to see that painting someplace in public domain, in a public place where everybody can uh, 
look at it, appreciate it, and remember our history. Is there a favorite painting? Is there one? Well, that you know, it's it like you're like making love with dogs. The last one, the best one. We get tomorrow, you gotta do it again, right? <laughs> you know, that's the world. You can never get up there. You always think you're going there. But that's the thing that makes you go on every day. Uh -huh. Makes you go on every day. Come marching, marching, we battle to Today, at the centennial of the Lawrence strike, Ralph Fazanella's painting reminds us vividly of the great victory for working people. These workers not only got the bread, they got the roses too. 100 years later, without unions protection, the working class has been losing ground. Workers' benefits keep shrinking, and it's getting harder and harder for a family to make ends meet. Ralph's art reminds us that the world is built by the working class. The only way for workers to get their fair share is to organize. Thank you.